So today we're going to basically cover three topics. And to start, I'd like to say that most authors and indie publishers understand the need for copy editing and cover design, but the art of book interior design is misunderstood today. And in some quarters, it has actually been abandoned and entirely forgotten, and sometimes with the help of people who should know better. So in this webinar today, my goal is to explain the function of professional book interior design and hopefully add to everyone's understanding about what it is and why it's necessary. So book design is important for really three major reasons. It's important for your buyer, it's important for your reader, and it's important for you. And I'll go on and talk a little bit about that as we go along. I do welcome your questions. And I'll be happy to pause at any time if I need to clarify something. So please do feel free to speak up. So what is, let me catch my mouse here. What am I doing? Okay, there we go. Okay, so what does interior design do for your buyer? Hopefully it makes them say to themselves, wow, this book looks like a good book. I want to learn more about it. I've never seen anything quite like this before. Your beautiful interior design should say, stop and read me. Don't browse away to that other book, buy me. So how do book designers do that? We accomplish that through dozens and dozens of design decisions about everything from where the words are placed on the page to the fonts that are chosen to the sizes that those fonts are used the trim size of the book, the binding style, even the paper that is, your book is printed on, all of these things work together to give your book an appropriate look and feel that not only matches your intent, but it also matches the expectations of your buyer. It doesn't matter whether buyers look at your book in person or they access the look inside feature on Amazon. Whatever decisions you make or don't make about your design, the interior of your book will send a message just like the cover does. So we want it to be the right message. And I thought today we could examine some bestseller layouts to show you what I mean by that. In this first example here, we have The Butterfly Effect by Andy Andrews. Now, this is a square format, six and a half by six and a half. The layout is open and airy. The fonts are classic and easy to read, the pages are in full color. Nobody has to tell us that this is an inspirational book, a high value book, a lovely gift perhaps. The design tells us that before we even have a chance to think about it. Now, in this next example, this layout couldn't be more different. It's a test preparation book. And here, the form of the book, the design decisions follow the function of the book. There's a lot of text on this page. The trim size is eight and a half, 11. There are two colors used, black and blue, to help the student navigate quickly to the desired information. And the wide outside margins allow a lot of room for note taking if that's what the student wants to do. So in this third example, we have a memoir. It's black and white, it's six by nine. The title page picks up on the cover design and the black and white rectangle concept is carried through to the date line of the chapter opening right here. It's tough to see here, but that's the date. And so anything we can do to give your book some visual interest is a benefit to the reader. It sends a message. So novels and memoirs like this example should never ever be boring. They can and should be designed just like any other nonfiction book. So fonts are critically important to your book design. Fonts send a message as well. The correct font for your book is not the font you like, but the font that is the most readable and the font that your end user can see and access to get your information. There are a bunch of different fonts down here that I chose. Can you choose fancy fonts like this? You know, a distressed font, for example, for a thriller or a mystery, sure. You just have to be really careful not to overdo it because there's a very fine line between appropriate font usage and a design that is corny. And that's a big mistake that people who do their own book layouts often make. 
So what does paper have to do with, with the message that your book sends? Well, a heavy, glossy, coated paper is often used in a coffee table book. Why? Because these books cost a lot of money. And for a little bit of extra expense at the printer, beautiful paper makes the photos pop and it sends a very high value message. Paper is also important for a standard black and white book, especially if you have photos in your book. The opacity of the paper has to be considered so that you don't want paper to, that is so thin that the photos on the other side of the page might show through and impede the text that the person is reading. So all of these things together, a publisher's job is to manage the reader's experience. Once, a big, once the big design decisions are made, we can get down to the nitty gritty details of typesetting. Now, nobody knows what typesetting is anymore, I'm sorry to say. It's, it's actually a science. There is a science called book page composition that serious publishers still follow when they lay out a book. Typesetters use professional page layout software and they follow dozens and dozens of rules to make sure that the spacing of your text is just so, which makes it a pleasure to read instead of a chore. Now, word processing software does not have the tools that you need to allow you to make these small spacing adjustments that improve the readability of your text. So going back to our study guide here for an example, here we have designed, we didn't design this book, but here the designer has put a line space between the paragraphs. Now there's a reason for that, it's just not a random decision. These line spaces pace the reader and enhance the comprehension of the material. If all of the text were crammed together on this page, it would be much more difficult for the student to learn anything. Now, in a novel, the goal is entirely different. We don't want to interrupt the reader between each paragraph. We want the reader to forget about the text and stay engaged with your story. So here, the usual technique is to use paragraph indents instead. Indents are a quick visual cue that the subject is about to change but they don't slow down and interrupt the reader as a line space would. Oftentimes we'll see homemade layouts with a space for novels with a space between paragraphs. And usually it's because the author says they like this and sometimes they want us to do it too. And that's when we fight back and we say, no, no, that's a dead giveaway that your book is self-published if you put a space between each paragraph in a novel. So, in the next few slides, I'm going to drill down even further and show more spacing issues that typesetters and book designers deal with as a matter of course. And, and these next examples, I hope, will show you the difference between good type and bad type so that when you see it, you'll recognize it. So in addition to line spacing, typesetters pay attention to kerning or letter spacing. Now the top example here shows the word yesterday as it might be produced in a word processor or even a page layout program without any intervention by the typesetter. Now, there's a little bit too much space between the Y and the E, and the other letters are spaced in a kind of an uneven way, and there's too much space between the last letter of the word and the period after it. Now, you might be tempted to say, so what, I can read it. But when we read, our brain accesses groups of letters at a time, not individual letters. So when the letter spacing is uneven, we have to work harder and our eyes get tired. So the bottom example shows what a little bit extra care can accomplish in the composition of that word. Can you see the difference? So, in addition to uneven letter spacing, uneven word spacing, particularly in justified text, is another hallmark of amateur book design. The top example here is a paragraph from a book that was laid out by the author using a word template. Now, I would never typeset a book using the font Arial to begin with, but, but leaving that aside, you can see that the word spacing in these three lines varies quite a bit apparently because hyphenation was turned off uh, in this template. In the bottom example, we have the exact same text, the exact same font, the exact same size, typeset in Adobe InDesign. Here you can see the spacing is much more even, it's less distracting, 
And additionally, the paragraph is now three lines long instead of four lines long. That's a 25% difference, which if it happens frequently in a 200 page book, let's say, that's gonna save you a considerable amount of money on the printing of your book. Now, another problem that turns up in typesetting and something that typesetters routinely fix is called rivers of white. This is fake text, of course, just to demonstrate the problem, but sometimes word spaces in a, in a paragraph align themselves in an unfortunate way, making a river of white here. And so a good typesetter will look for this as they typeset your book and will spot this and will adjust the spacing to get rid of distractions like this. So what makes a book look like a book? Uh, the short answer is that it's the book block. And what that means is that the text begins and ends at the same spot on every page. Now this looks easy, but here's where we run into even more book composition rules when the text in your book doesn't cooperate. In book design, we have to avoid two things basically called widows and orphans. Now, that doesn't mean we're heartless people, it just means that we don't want to distract the reader. In the top example here, on the left, a widow is the first line of a paragraph that falls at the bottom of a page. And in the bottom example here, an orphan is the last line of a paragraph that happens to fall at the top of the page. Now, remember, we, these, we, we remember these definitions by saying a widow is left behind and an orphan goes on alone. Now, this happens all the time when we're laying out a book. Remember, we have to deal with that pesky book block which we've set up. So what do we do when the first line of a paragraph falls at the bottom of a page or the last line of a paragraph falls at the top of the page? Um, what we have to do as typesetters is go back and forth and back and forth and adjust other paragraphs in that chapter until we can correct this problem. We may add a little, add a line or delete a line from another paragraph and by adjusting the spacing in minor ways to make the text fall where it's supposed to on this page. So this is where all the time goes in book design. Sometimes, sometimes people will say, well, why do you charge me so much per page to design your book? And that's because we're not just doing that page in 15 seconds, we're doing that page and we're doing all the pages before and after to make that book block fall into place like it should. So to begin to wrap this, oops, oops, yeah. Okay, here's another issue to avoid in book design and that is called ladders. Ladders are in essence too many hyphens in a row, like you see here. Remember before we solve the spacing problem with a hyphen? Well, that sounds easy enough. Well, too many hyphens in a row are a distraction to the reader as well and that's something what we want, that we want to avoid. So there are a host of book design rules surrounding hyphens and all of them are broken in this newspaper column example. So we have here hyphenation after two letters, which is really bad because that makes it really hard for the reader to guess what the word might be. We have hyphenation of a proper noun. We have four hyphens in a row. And if you're beginning to understand now why typesetters get gray hair, these are just a few of the rules we follow, but I'm gonna leave it at that because I don't wanna put you to sleep. So to begin to wrap this up, I'd like to show two before and, exa before and after examples of books that are, were designed by authors and then redesigned by a book designer. In this chapter opener on the left, the author purchased InDesign, but his table here takes up almost the whole page. Now his book was filled with tables, so here again the page count would have been enormous if he finished the book using this sort of a format. In the redesign at the right, the table was reset in a more efficient condensed font and it was given some visual interest with the gray screens. And the trim size was also changed to allow the tables to take up less space, so in this layout, the author is going to pay to print far fewer pages than he would have paid using his own design. Now, in this example here, on the left is a title page that was designed by the author, again, using InDesign. But as you can see, the composition is, is somewhat lacking. The author did what he thought was fine, 
But on the right, this title page has now been redesigned and the cover graphic was incorporated and the fonts from the cover were used instead so that the first page of the book, when people are just beginning to pick up that book to read, the first page is now as visually interesting as the cover. There isn't a letdown when they open the book. So as I said earlier, whatever you do, your book design will send a message. So we wanna make sure it doesn't look self-published. Why? Because reviewers will know. All the rules we just talked about, the reviewers all know them. They understand these rules and they will immediately flag your book as an amateur production if they see that these rules have been broken. Your buyers will know that your interior, interior design is good. Yes, they will. They may not know the rules of book design, but they know when they see a beautiful book and they instinctively understand quality when they are looking at it. And most important of all, you will know that you produced a beautiful book. And that pride of craftsmanship is going to manifest itself in your smile, in your tone of voice, in everything you do to market your book. And that is why interior book design matters. So I'm done talking now. Uh, do you have any questions about anything that we just covered? I don't think we have any questions quite yet, Michelle. Um, but everyone in attendance, now is your time to uh, ask Michelle any questions you might have, and you can do so in the Q&A box or the chat box. There are two places to ask questions. Hmm. So Lori just asked, um, what font do you use in books? Oh, well, that depends on, on the book. If you're talking about a novel, there are some classic fonts that that we use over and over again, such as Adobe Garamond Pro or Palatino or sometimes Caslon. Um, I happen to like Saban, S-A-B-O-N. It's a very efficient font that gets a lot of words on the line and, and yet it's still very readable. So uh, usually a serif font for any kind of text that is continuous reading. And then sometimes we'll go to sans serif fonts um, for pull quotes or something else just to have a little bit of contrast so that the reader knows that, okay, this is a quote, this is different from uh, the main body of the text. It, it all depends, every book is different and we let the, the content of the manuscript dictate the design to a certain extent. And Karen just asked, how do you communicate with a designer when the ultimate cost of production is a concern? Well, it, it, the cost of production is a concern, but as I, I said here, we do spend a lot of time on your book. And that's what um, gives your book the professional appearance that readers expect. There's a flood of really bad books on the market right now. And I personally worry about that because I'm worried that when people buy some of these homemade books and self-published books, that they're gonna come to the conclusion that books aren't worth the risk. And that really worries me a lot, not only as a designer, but as a reader. I want people to, to buy books and I want people to enjoy books and get the message that they're supposed to be getting from that book layout. And Karen asked another question. She asked, what are some design differences between genres? Well, uh, different genres are, are produced in a different way. Like I went back here before, a, a, a test preparation book is designed one way, a novel is designed another. Um, each genre of book, again, the text sort of directs the design. And that's what we look at when we sit down and we first design your book. We, we look at the nature of the text, so, you know, what's the same, what's, the, what's different, how can we design this book so that it has the fewest number of pages, but it's still legible and readable and accessible to the end user. Lots of decisions there. And then Karen said regarding her first question about the ultimate cost of production, she said, regarding costs, I mean details that affect printing costs such as bleeds, die cuts, colors, et cetera. I don't, I don't quite follow that, that question, Karen. Um, well, printing costs are one thing and, and production design and production costs are another. I mean, bleeds usually costs a little bit more. Color costs more than black and white. Um, is that what you meant? Yeah, maybe clarify, Karen, if that's not what you meant, and then we'll answer your question in a bit. 
Uh, Brent said, can you talk about how to choose the best font size and line spacing? Well, that, again, that depends on the trim size of the book. It depends on the nature of the text. And when we design a book, we, we maybe go through five, ten samples before everyone is happy with with the readability and the and the, the look of the text. So there's a lot of considerations that go into that. I, I, I get this question quite a bit. People want to know, well, what font should I use if, if I'm going to do the book myself? Well, there is no one answer for that. Um, it, it, the author's taste is important. The nature of the text is important. Lots of considerations. And Jack, I believe is the name, asked, what is the current wisdom regarding use of italics or bold typefaces in novels? Well, I, I, my advice for that would be don't overdo it because that's a hallmark of a self-published book. Um, italics should be used only when you really have to emphasize the word. Um, in, in a novel, for instance, I don't think I would ever use bold. Um, too much of that it can seem like you're being condescending to your reader as if you're saying, I don't think you're capable of understanding this text unless I, I make it bold or I make it italic. So uh, just be real careful with that. Um, most of the time italics are used just to refer to the first instance of a word that's going to recur or a word that's in the glossary or a foreign word. Uh, mostly these techniques aren't really needed. And Philip asked, what point size do you consider to be comfortable in general? Well, that varies with the font, surprisingly enough, because you can have 11 point, uh, an 11 point size in one font that looks much bigger than 11 point in another font. So you have to let your eyes be the judge of that and you have to just print it out. I always recommend printing it out on a laser printer because that's going to give you a truer uh, image of what the final book will look like rather than an inkjet printer. Um, and then just let your eyes be your guide and try different things, you know, sometimes adding as little as one point of letting to, to the, the, the line spacing can make a real difference in how readable that text is. And Jack asked again, do you prefer a classic look for a book on Civil War history? Yes, I would definitely go in that direction for any kind of a historical book, um, especially with the chapter openers, uh, the design of the chapter openers. You want to get, you want to set a mood for the reader with the design. And so fonts from the period may be useful for that. Definitely a serif uh, font. Uh, rather than a sans serif font, because sans serif fonts are actually modern fonts. They were invented much later than, than serif fonts. And Ross asked, how do you set up a book block using InDesign? Well, you, you set it up on a master page and you, you define on the master page uh, the area where you want the text to fall. Um, but like I said, you know, the text doesn't always cooperate with that. So when you get down into pulling in your manuscript and, and uh, flowing the text in, then you have to go back and fix those problems. Now, InDesign does allow you to use a feature called vertical justification, which would, and, and keep, what they call keep options, where you can tell it to keep the first two lines in a paragraph together or the last two lines in a paragraph together. So, but that's not the way to, to, to design a quality book because if you employ those techniques together, what's going to happen is InDesign will increase the line spacing between all the lines of text on that page when that instance occurs. And that's really visible and that looks really ugly. So we prefer to go in and manually correct when we have a, a widow or an orphan. An attendee asked, uh, said that they're working on a photography book. What fonts do you recommend for the pull quotes and captions specific to coffee table photo books? Well, th that, that's kind of a, a big category, a coffee table book about what? Again, uh, you know, you have, the book should be designed in keeping with its subject matter. There is no one answer for that. So Bridget, maybe if you want to specify a bit, Michelle can go on in a bit. Um, so Karen uh, clarified her cost question a bit, a bit. She said, how can I best communicate to a designer regarding ultimate production costs? For example, a recent project, the designer provided a wonderful design that was four color, full bleeds on all pages. 
which was too expensive for her to print. Ah, well, I, I guess what I would say is that you need to work backwards and get printing quotes from your printer first and decide how you want to design the book before, the, before you set your designer loose. You know, the time to find out that you can't afford to print the book is not after it's designed, um, it's, it's before. So you gotta run your printing numbers in advance and then tell your designer, okay, this is what we can afford to do. We'd like to keep it to this page count if possible and then work together to accomplish that. Philip asked, what parameters would you recommend for hyphenation in a novel? I particularly like two hyphens in a row. I, I don't like any more than that. To me, three hyphens in a row looks like a ladder. Um, hyphens are inherently distracting, so you wanna use as few as possible and make sure that another setting I use is I make sure a word is, always has three letters before a hyphen and at least four letters after a hyphen, because I don't want to read the first half of a word and then find ing on the next line. So I want InDesign to break those words in a way that allows me to guess at the word and not slow down when I'm reading. Uh, Brigitte asked, is there a rule or guide to how to split or structure the page in terms of margins and overall layouts? Well, the margins are typically required by your printer, especially print, uh, print on demand printers, they have requirements for that. Um, the, the safest thing is a half of an inch on top, bottom, and on the trim side. And the gutter margin is gonna vary depending on your page count. The, the POD printers have requirements for that too. A book that's 600 pages needs a wider margin in the gutter than a book that's 200 pages. But basically what you want to happen is when the, the reader opens that book, you want the, the margins to look relatively even. And some of that gutter margin is gonna disappear into the binding. So you have to account for that when you're, when you're judging how much space to use. And then back to the question about the coffee table photography book, uh, what fonts do you recommend for the pull quotes and captions specific to coffee table photo books? And the book is about natural disasters and um, they're hoping to honor human resilience and the spirit of survival. Hmm. Well, I, I think that that's not a specific, um, I don't know. I think for that I would stick with classic fonts, especially if the disasters span an, uh, a, a longer time period, for example. If you're writing about disasters starting from the 1800s to the present day, well then you can't find a period font that would work for that whole timeline. So then I would stick to something that is, that doesn't have a personality, a classic font like maybe um, a Garamond or something like that. Rachel wants you to talk about um, converting from PDFs um, into eBooks. And she said rules for eBooks don't apply for hard copy. For example, you don't want hyphens in eBooks. Can you speak on these issues? Yeah, the, the hyphenation issue is actually controlled not by the person who made the eBook, but by the device that the person is reading on. So, so eBooks really aren't designed in any sense of the word. They're, they're basically a set of instructions that are given to the device. And then the end user can override those instructions by increasing the size of the type and, and, and you know, the, pay, the screen size varies depending on whether someone is reading it on a phone or on an iPad, for example. So we don't recommend making an eBook out of, from a PDF. We, we, we format our eBooks from scratch because there are a lot of different things to consider. When we do an eBook, for instance, we'll, we will include an instruction in the file that says, if this book is being opened on a Kindle, do this. If it's being opened on an iPad or a Nook, do this. There's a lot of program that, programming that goes into an eBook uh, if you want it to look good. Now, we've all seen eBooks that, that look terrible and we've seen eBooks that look almost as good as the print book. And the difference is the formatting that's done. And Rachel also um, wanted to know, should the publisher expect a few choices of design layouts for a book before signing on? 
Oh, absolutely. Well, not before signing on. You know, we don't do samples before we're hired, but once you do hire us, we will typically start with two interior design samples. And then at that point, we work back and forth with you and get your feedback. You know, sometimes people will say, well, I like the headers in this sample, but I like the, the, the text font that you used in that sample. Can I see a combination of the two? And then we'll, we'll do that. And we work back and forth until all of the design decisions have been hammered out at the sample stage because nobody wants to, to type that two or 300 pages and then find out that the font isn't the right size. So we do all the hard work at the sample stage. Karen wants to know, are there guidelines for the proportions of spacing above or below a heading? Well, it may, it's, it, you remember I talked about the book block. If you make the space, of, if, if you set your letting, let's say to, I don't know, 15 points, and then you put 15 points above a subhead, that helps you stay, that helps the text align to the book block. Every space in your book layout should be a multiple of the primary letting that you're using between the lines. Now, sometimes you have to fudge that a little bit. Sometimes, depending on how you want it to look, you might say put 10 points, 10 points above a subhead and five points below. But as long as they add up to the 15 points of lead that you used in the text, you'll, you'll still be all right. And Leah wants to know if Designing a small book, 25 to 35 pages, is it wise to include full page, full color, color images, or better to keep them smaller? This is for a parenting quick reference book. Um, that's really an, an editorial decision. I mean, uh, the, the main problem I would have with a 25 page book is that it's gonna be tough for you to sell it for um, any kind of a, a, a decent retail price because to the buyer, that's gonna look like a booklet and they're not gonna be willing to pay much for that. All right, so it looks like those are all the questions we have now, but I actually have a question, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, so today, I think most, if not all, of the attendees are self-publishing authors or they're from indie presses. So do you work with a lot of self-publishers and a lot of indie um, publishers? Oh yeah, almost all of our clients come to us for, uh, with their first book, their indie publishing for the first time, and, and, and a lot of the time we spend with people is actually talking about self-publishing and, and helping them work their way through the maze of information that's out there, um, as well as designing their book. Interesting. And do they, um, do you ever get authors that come to you with a cover that they already created themselves and then you kind of try to help them improve the cover? Is that a common trend? Yeah, I, there's, there's no obligation to use us for both the cover and the interior, although we would love if you do that, but, but uh, you can hire us for just the text or just the cover. And, um, you know, if you ask us for a critique of your cover, we'll be happy to do that. Um, but we do need to get hired if you want us to improve it. All right, so Joyce said, I would be interested to know Michelle's position on using rules, lines in the header or footer. Um, with or without rules or lines are correct. It just depends. That's a matter of taste. Um, novels don't have to have headers at all um, unless you really want to put the title of the book at the top of the page over and over again. Uh, especially if they don't, if a novel doesn't have chapter titles, you can just leave the headers out entirely. Just a matter of taste. And, and those are the options that you and your designer can work through as you see different ways of doing that and, and decide what you like the best. Cool. Uh, Karen wants to know, can you talk a bit about page proportions, things like text blocks versus margins, the placement of running heads and footers, and page numbers, also the use of multiple columns? Well, multiple, let's go back in, backwards from your question. Multiple columns could be used when you have a very large trim size, like eight and a half, eleven. 11. Um, in that test preparation book example I showed you, in that instance, the, the designer decided to use one column of text, but make a very wide outside margin for note taking. Um, sometimes people will have an eight and a half, eleven book, for instance, and they'll want to have two columns of text. I would say that works for nonfiction titles for sure, uh, depending on depending on the subject matter. It can also create problems in layout if because now you have the, the issue of having to make both columns balance out as well as just one book block. 
So it just all depends on the nature of your book. Now, as far as margins go, the, the printer's requirements usually specify the minimum margins. It doesn't mean you can't make them bigger if you want to. You can put the page numbers at the top of the page or at the bottom of the page. Sometimes on a, a large size page layout, you can put the page numbers at, on the side of the page at the trim size, uh, at the trim side. So um, these are all design decisions that you and design, your designer can work out together. Thanks. And Rachel, you asked if Michelle could re-answer the questions on costs. Um, and we've gotten quite a few cost questions. So if you could be a little more specific, I'm sure she'll be happy to um, address a cost, a specific cost question you might have. Um, Johnny asked, how do you use justified and left justified text to manage uneven word placement? How do I use justified and not justified text? I, I don't follow, I'm sorry. Justified and left justified. I don't know if that helps. Well, I, I, I don't understand. I'm sorry. No? Okay. Johnny, would you mind um, rewording your question so we can better understand? Thank you. And then, Rachel, if you want to ask your cost question, we would be more than happy to answer that. Michelle, since you're offering the 5% discount, what are some of the services that the attendees today could um, partake in? Oh, they can they can get 5% off on any service that they want to order. And we have all of our services and pricing fully described at 1106design.com. Um, I'm a, a believer in, in giving this information up front and, and, and not uh, making people ask for it and wait for it. So if you go to our website, you'll find out everything you need to know. Awesome. And so you guys do um, cover design, you do interior design. You said something about you do critiques of covers? Yeah. yeah. If anybody wants a cover critique, I'll be happy to do that for you just, just because it's fun to do. Uh, we offer four different levels of cover design to, to meet most everyone's budget. And we offer uh, editorial services as well, copy editing, substantive editing. We can also help with uh, writing your book cover text, your back cover text. We can help write your title. If your book is um, nonfiction with a lot of uh, details in it, we also offer indexing. And of course, we offer ebook formatting. Awesome. A plethora of options. And we, uh, and we also offer author websites if you need a website. Very cool. That's a lot of services. Um, Philip said that he has heard one book designer say that the first paragraph of a chapter or subchapter should not be indented as it is more professional. What is your opinion on this? Well, it, I get in trouble for this because, because uh, we always learned that the first paragraph after a subhead or the first paragraph of a, of a, a section after a, a, a line break, for example, when you have a scene change, the first paragraph doesn't need an indent because we don't need to make the, the reader pause there. They, are, they can see clearly from the surrounding layout that this is a new event, so to speak. Um, when we, with some authors, when we take that indent out, uh, they, they want us to put it back in. So um, it's really not necessary because the purpose of an indent is to create a pause. And Johnny asked, do you have suggestions for when to use fully justified text, even edges right and left, and ragged right or left justified? Well, in, in um, almost all books, I would recommend justified text because, again, it's that book block that makes a book look like a book and not like a word process document. There are times when if you're typesetting text in a narrow column, for example, then you might want to go to ragged right text uh, without hyphens because you don't want to have too many hyphens and you don't want to distract the reader with unsightly word spaces if you try to justify text on a very narrow measure. Brent said, this is more of an overall design question than an interior design question, but is there a standard book size for a novel? Many seem to be 5.25 by 8. Well, the, the, I recommend that people go to the print-on-demand printers and look at their standard sizes and just think about that a little bit. Um, the, the standard sizes are five and a half, eight and a half, and six by nine. But 
recently in the marketplace, people have been choosing smaller sizes, more like five by eight or five and a quarter by eight. The reason I tell people to go to the POD printers websites first is that uh, an offset book printer can print a book at any trim size. They can trim it to whatever size you want, but the POD printers limit you to the trim sizes they offer. So if you choose one of those sizes, you can always print your book at an offset printer as well if you decide to do that, but you can't go in reverse. In other words, if you go to an offset book printer and you create uh, your book is created in a size that a POD printer cannot offer you, then you have to you go into the unwelcome territory of having to redo your interior layout. So it's just easier to pick one of the standard sizes at the POD printing uh, places. All right, so we have a few more minutes, guys. If you have any other questions for Michelle, um, I don't see any. Oh, okay, so it looks like Rachel asked a question. What do you think about including an index in an ebook as it doesn't have any page numbers that it can reference? Well, yeah, that, that's problematic because for that very reason. Um, some people include the index as it was in the print book, uh, with the, even with the page numbers intact, um, but there's no pages in an ebook. So uh, some people want to make anchors from the index back to the location in the ebook. That's a really labor intensive uh, thing to, to ask the ebook designer to do. I just I recommend leaving it out because people, if you're reading an ebook, you can search for any word you want at any time, and it'll take you right there. So, so in that sense, of um, an index is, is sort of made unnecessary in the ebook world. Amy asked, in a novel, is there a standard way to format a flashback, or how do you decide that format? Well, that's the things we work out when we're, we're looking at your text and, and thinking about different ways to design the interior. You could, a flashback could be indented text. It could be, um, if, it, if it's not too lengthy, maybe then you could make it italic. I don't recommend large passages of text in italic because that's really hard to read. Um, you might put um, a little icon above and below the flashback or a rule. Anything, lots of different devices can be used to let the reader know, okay, we're taking a pause from the present day and now we're, we're in the past. And Emily asked, in a nonfiction history book, do you prefer endnotes or footnotes? I, I, it depends. I, as a reader now, I, I don't mind footnotes if, if they're explaining something in the text that helps me to, to understand the text right away, okay? I get annoyed at footnotes if they're just a reference to another publication or a source. So it depends on the nature of, of your, your notes. Johnny said, could you talk a bit about cover design if there aren't more questions on page design? Sure, what do you wanna know? Yeah, Johnny, why don't you ask us some uh, specific cover design questions? Michelle will answer them. Um, and we do have a few other page design questions. Karen said, what are some of the design issues that give a book its feel, such as formal versus informal, serious versus funny, et cetera? Well, that's where, that's where the font would, would play a very large role. Um, if you want, to, if a, a book is a humorous book, for instance, then I would say maybe we can talk about using a friendly sans serif font. Uh, formal, you always want to go with serif fonts. That's because they are formal. And Philip said, what size would you recommend for a pocketbook? Something that can be easily carried around. I'm looking at seven by four at the moment. Um, again, I would stick with the, the trim sizes that are available at the POD printers. Let me, let me, let me dig in my, my uh, notes here and see if I can grab the, the chart with the trim sizes. Okay. The, the smallest trim size that's available at most POD printers is five by eight. Which is, which is kind of handy to hold in your hand. Jack has a, okay, so here are the cover design questions, Michelle. Uh, how would you handle an author who brings you a beautiful painting he created for the cover that allows no room for graphic design or type? How would I do that? Well, I would probably, I don't know, I'd have to see it. Um, probably I would use the, the picture and put the title above, reduce the size of the, of the painting. Put the title above and the author name below. It's 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 
tough to answer without seeing what you've got. And Johnny said, what rules do you have for covers? How big should the title be? What about the subtitle? Colors or design elements that work well to attract someone to pick up the book? Oh, I'd like to tell you there are rules, but but that's the experimentation part of book design. We we just the, the length of the title sometimes determines how large it can be, especially if there's a great big long word in the title. Um, the nature of the book um, it helps to answer that question. For example, a, a book of poetry might be designed in a more literary style, and the title might be set very small and stacked off to the side. Um, it just really depends. And Michelle, this is actually Michelle's second webinar with us, and her first webinar was called Anatomy of a Book Cover. So I recommend checking that out if any of you here have not checked it out yet. I know so I recognize some of you from that webinar as well, but I'll be sure to send that to you, Johnny. Um, all right, that looks like, it looks like we have one other question. In what computer format do you like to receive manuscripts that you are going to do the design for? Uh, Microsoft Word is the standard. We can always work with a Word file if, if you're not using Word to, to uh, create your manuscript. If you can save it in the format uh, RTF, rich text format, that also works because that will retain your italics and, and any other minor formatting that you might have incorporated into the text. Philip so asked, do you have any guidelines for what should go on the rear cover? Uh, well, the rear cover is your sales pitch. Okay, so, so you want to use every square inch of the back cover to give the buyer a reason to buy your book. Uh, you shouldn't repeat the title on the back cover. Uh, it's just a waste of space. Uh, I recommend starting the back cover text with a catchy headline if you can. Why make the, the reader of the back cover wade into the text to find out why they should buy the book? Tell them right up front. And sometimes the back cover text can end with, with a call to action. Um, not so much with a with a novel, maybe, but but especially with a nonfiction book, you want to tell the reader why they need your book, what problem uh, is it going to solve for them, why should they decide to spend money right now and not delay. All right. So if you guys have any last questions, now it's time to ask them. And Michelle, do you mind going to the slide that has our contact info? Sure. Uh, Thanks. So just to remind you guys today, the webinar is being recorded and you will all receive a downloadable copy uh, by the end of the week. If you have any questions, um, you can email myself, molly at ibpaonline.org, and you can, are more than welcome to email Michelle with any questions as well and to um, ask her about the 5% discount she's offering everyone today. Yep, and I'm also offering, for anyone who would care to download it, a, a free copy of my book, Published Like the Prose, A Brief Guide to Quality Self-Publishing, and you can download that at 1106design.com. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. This was great, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate if, if you're if you're the shy type and you don't like to ask questions in public, just send me an email, and I'll be happy to talk with you. Yep. And I will be emailing you guys your copy of today's webinar by the end of the week. So be on the lookout for that. Thanks again, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.